I was privileged enough to give the Keynes Lecture in London uh, in October, and given the nature of the occasion, it ended up being an excursion into the history of economic thought, which isn't actually my field. And in particular, I looked at the development of this doctrine of secular stagnation, which is a phrase that you may have seen mentioned in newspapers a few times since about November 2013, when Larry Summers uh, revived it. Um, uh, it's an interesting story, as it happens, how this doctrine came about. It involves the collision of a very old-fashioned British tradition of economic thinking with a much more dynamic uh, version of economics that was uh, personified in by a fellow, a Danish-American, as it happens, called called Alvin Hansen. And, and being an academic myself, I tend to get very interested by this kind of stuff. But don't worry, that's not what I'm going to be talking about. Um, it turns out that your views on secular stagnation might have an implication for how big you think the state ought to be. And that's the angle that Jill and Dan picked up on, and that's what I was asked to talk about. So I want to talk about secular stagnation and the size of the state, because I tend to do what I'm told, usually. Um, but I also thought I'd broaden it out a little bit, given the nature of this audience and the fact that we're interested in Europe and so on, and that Europe's going through interesting times right now, politically, uh, and talk about political arguments uh, regarding the role of the state. I'm going to suggest, it's not an original point, um, that states and markets should be thought of as complementary, not as substitutes for each other, as, as people on both the left and, and right would sometimes have us uh, believe. So um, let me begin by, oh, here's the pen, isn't it? By, by, by showing you this, this graph. Uh, it's uh, plotting world industrial output uh, during two crises, the Great Depression of the 19... 20s and 30s, uh, and our own great recession. Uh, in each case, the graph is plotted where the, so immediate, the peak immediately pre-crisis is 100. So this is the blue line here. This is what happens after June 1929. So world industrial output, you know, as you can see, really collapses, you know, falls by almost 40% until about 1933, and then, there's a, and then there's a sharp recovery. This is what happened during our own great recession. This is April 2008, following the red line now. As you can see, the first year of the crisis was as bad as the Great Depression, which was rather extraordinary. That's, that's the, the, the angle that we seized on at the time when we first started drawing these things. But then there was a very quick recovery after Gordon Brown saved the world, if you remember that. My, my kids thought that was funny when, when they heard that back in 2009. Uh, but anyway, we did do better this time around. But then what you can see is this is now 2010. The world's going Greek, and we're all afraid that we're Greek, and so on. Uh, uh, reflation is replaced with austerity and so on, the thing starts to peter out uh, and at this stage we've actually been overtaken by the Great Depression series which is pretty bloody pathetic. Um, and it's not surprising that this secular stagnation uh, view of the world emerges when it does in either the former case or in the latter case. So when Alvin Hansen uh, comes to Harvard from the Midwest, he's not a, at all a Keynesian actually before he goes and he goes to Harvard, and all of a sudden, things, things change uh, dramatically, intellectually, for him. So is it that he's in this, you know, Moscow on the, on the Charles, uh, or is it that the world economy goes off a cliff just as he arrives? I think that it probably had something to do with the fact that the world economy went off a cliff just as he, arrives, uh, just as he arrived in Harvard. And he began to think, well, maybe there's something to this Keynesian business after, after all. Uh, and similarly, Larry Summers uh, revives... Alvin Hansen's old uh, thesis, which his uncle, by the way, Paul Samuelson, for those of you who are interested in the history of thought, had been very much involved in developing as it happens. So there's a, an element of filial piety here going on as well. He revives it in 2013, late 2013, when it's clear that our own recovery is sort of petering out just uh, a little bit. Now, what is Alvin Hansen's argument? I'll give it to you in words and then I'll give you some some, some, some equations, but in words it's fine, right? So one of the stylized facts about uh, long-run growth is that the ratio of the capital stock to output is roughly constant. Now, it's not actually constant, it does vary, but it's roughly constant over the sufficiently long run. So if the ratio of capital to output is roughly constant, they must be growing at the same rate. And if they're growing at the same rate, then the capital stock must be growing at the rate of GDP. And GDP by definition, must grow at the sum of the rate of growth of output per capita plus the rate of growth of the number of capitas. 
right? So output in the long run grows at G, uh, growth rate of output per capita, plus M, the population growth rate. And in most economic models, G, the rate of growth of output per capita, is somehow related to technological progress. So you can think of that as being a measure of the technological progressivity of the society that you're in. So the capital stock is going to grow at a rate G plus M. And since the function of investment is to add to the capital stock, it's pretty easy to see that uh, investment will be related to the growth rate of the capital stock, and that the level of investment at any point in time will therefore be related to the sum of G plus N, which implies that if population growth slows, so there aren't as many new people coming on stream, each of which has got to be supplied with a certain amount of capital, or if the rate of technological progress G slows, so that there isn't as many new technologies out there that need to be embodied in new plant and equipment, then the rate of investment demand will slow. Now that's not necessarily a problem, you know, uh, less investment demand, well then maybe we consume more. That would be the thing. Instead of spending our money investing in new plant and equipment, we just, we just, we just eat more, you know, or whatever we do, you know. That would be fine. Uh, but Hansen worried that savings propensities are very sticky. They're very deeply embedded in, in human societies. Think about the Germans or the French and the way they save. It's, very, it's a sociological thing. You can't just get the savings right down. And here's the problem. Because savings is taking money out of the system. It's taking spending out of the system. Uh, that's not a problem if those savings are then transferred to the businessmen who are going to invest it. You know, the, the issue arises if there's too much savings out there and not enough investment demand. Then you get purchasing power being withdrawn from the economy and you might get unemployment arising as a result because of a lack of aggregate demand. And the secular bit of this secular stagnation argument is that because this shortfall in investment demand is being driven by the movement in long-run variables like the rate of technological progress, or demographic change, you might actually end up with an unemployment problem in the long run. That, that was the worry. Now, what does the long run mean? I think it varies depending on whether you're British or American. I think that the Brits, because they lived on a small, crowded island, always had in their heads the vision of the world where there were sharply diminishing returns to everything because there's only so much land to go around, and so uh, there's sharply diminishing returns to labor, to capital, and everything else. So when they thought secular, they really meant secular. I think Hansen thought more in terms of long swings. So there'd be times when there'd be a technological upswing, you invent the railways, or invent the internal combustion engine, or the internet, maybe, who knows, you know? But then there are troughs as well. So Hansen you know, didn't have a view that we would be stagnating forever, actually, if you read him carefully. But he thought that there might be longish periods of time, 10, 20, 30 years, where there might be a shortfall of aggregate demand because it wouldn't be the investment demand to sustain full employment. And then the question is, what should we do about it? And he thought that government should get involved. And that, that's, what, that's what his conversion was in 1937, when he sees the world economy going off a cliff again, which shouldn't have happened, according to his old way of thinking. He thinks maybe government fiscal policy should step in. That's where he sort of meets Keynes briefly. I mean, if you want the same argument in, 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 in letters, that's, that's how it works. So investment as a share of uh, GDP is equal to, if it's net investment, the change in the capital stock divided by GDP, we divide above and below the line by the capital stock. So investment as a share of GDP is equal to the growth rate of the capital stock times the capital output ratio. And if the ratio of capital to Q is constant, then capital will grow at the same rate as output, which by definition is growing at N plus G. That's just saying the same thing as I said before, for those of you who like that sort of thing. So there's a, there's a claim here. There's an empirical claim. The empirical claim is that when demographic uh, change happens so the population is growing more slowly, and when technological progress is also slower, then you might have unemployment emerging over longish periods of time, you know, over maybe a decade. So that's a, that's a claim that you can test. It's a, an odd thing. It's saying if you have fewer children being born, if you have fewer people coming into the labor force, you might end up with more unemployment, which seems very counterintuitive, right? But it's happening because it, those extra people are generating a demand for capital that generates a demand for investment and so on. That's how, that's, that's how the logic works. Well. This isn't very scientific, it's just a scatter plot. Uh, here I have the sum of population growth plus the rate of technological progress plotted against the unemployment rate for various periods, sort of medium run periods, you might say. So there's the golden age of 1950 to 73, there's the interwar period, 
And you know, the, the claim is that when n plus g is higher, unemployment should be lower. And there, that there's clearly a negative slope if you look at the, the British data points, the blues. And actually, there's a negative slope as well. It's flatter. But there is a clear negative slope if you look at the American data points, with one, with one obvious exception here. That doesn't fit the story at all. And actually, we know why this is the case. Uh, the interwar period is an incredibly technologically progressive period in American history. Just think about newsreels of World War I, compare it with newsreels of World War II, you know, jet planes landing on aircraft carriers and, and all of that, you know, and think about all of the white goods, all of the electricity-related things they were already consuming in the 1930s. Very, very technologically progressive. So this was just, they just screwed up here. This is just bad monetary policy, you know? That's, that's the exception in a way that proves the rule. Otherwise, the, the correlation between both of those lines is about negative 0.8. So maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's something to it. That's all I'm kind of going to suggest for now. So then you want to think about, well, what should we expect going forward? And actually what I'm going to say is I don't know. I don't think economists can predict the future. But it's still you know, useful to think about these things. There are things that are more predictable. There are things that are less predictable. The things that are more predictable are probably demography. We have some notion of where population change is going to go in the future. Now, mind you, they thought that in the 1930s as well. Uh, demographic uh, change, you know, uh, population was at almost ground to a halt in uh, Britain. And it was sharply slowing in America in the interwar period. And Keynes and Hansen would talk about this. And then what did we get? We got the baby boom. You know, so actually after World War II. So even something as relatively predictable as demographic change, you know, you can get wrong. But most estimates think that population growth is going to slow. I suppose most of us hope that at the global level, population growth does slow. Now, where is it going to be most of a problem? Well, we know where it's going to be most of a problem. It's going to be a problem, in, in, especially in Europe and Japan. So in Japan, population growth is already negative, as you know. And it's a very interesting question to ask in this kind of context. How do the Japanese manage to sustain such low uh, unemployment rates? You know, uh, investment demand should be low. And, Japan, it probably is low, and yet they're doing something right with their labor markets that they managed to keep unemployment down to 3 4% in a way that we're not managing in Europe. But, but Europe is not far behind, you know? And where is the, the demand for capital going to be driven by demography? It's going to be sub-Saharan Africa, pretty obviously. Uh, and so anything that we could do to make it easier for people to invest in sub-Saharan Africa would be good because that would provide a productive outlet for our our capital. I'm thinking in global terms now because there's a world capital market these days. It may not go on forever like that, but that's, that's the way you should think about it uh, for the moment, I think. When it comes to technological progress, it's very hard to, to foresee the future. I think it's impossible to foresee the future. There's a big debate right now about uh, whether the low rates of measured technological progress Wait, my, you know, be careful about the words I use. These are rough guesstimates of technological progress. There's a lot of other stuff bundled up in these numbers. You know, as you can see, they're lower now relative to where they were during the sort of internet boom and so on, and uh, the, uh, the technology boom of the late 90s. You know, but what you also see is that it's very volatile, but that there was a clear slowdown after the oil crisis. This is American technological progress we're talking about here. So there was a well-known technological slowdown, and the question is, did we recover during the 90s, or is that a blip? You know, or is it this that's the blip? Well, we don't know. You know, we don't know. If you're optimistic, I guess you would say that hopefully we will get a wave of innovations in technologies involving new energy, uh, involving transportation, and, and this kind of thing. Uh, if we don't get those waves of innovations, probably we have worse things to be worrying about than secular stagnation. You know, but we can also think about robotics. We can think about. Uh, innovations in the biological sciences and so on. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, one of the best known economic historians ever, Simon Kuznets, used to tell his students that if you want to predict the technological future, go read science fiction. Um, so we, we don't know. But we do know, I think, that, that population growth is slowing. And, 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 and that is something worth bearing in mind. Th those are all factors that are lowering the demand for investment. But they make secular stagnation more likely. But there are other things working in the other direction that are lowering saving supplies. We think they will lower saving supplies. In particular, there are, we have aging populations. So this is just a graph showing the ratio of working age to non-working age population. And it's the working age people who are saving, you know? The people who are no longer working are dissaving. So as this ratio falls, savings rates ought to decline. And they're declining even in East Asia, which is important because East Asia accounts for a huge share 
of the world savings rate. On the other hand, another thing that I think is fairly predictable is that the developing world hopefully will continue to catch up on the rich world, that the developing world's share of world GDP will increase. And that matters because the developing world has a much higher propensity to save than the rich economies. So as we share, as we move income towards the, the poorer countries, that will tend to increase savings rates. So it'll work in the opposite direction from that factor, which is lowering savings rates everywhere. So it's very hard to know what the balance is going to be. That's the future. What about the present? Here, I think you're on maybe safer ground. You know, uh, if secular stagnation is a problem, one way to conceptualize this is to think in terms of what the level of, of interest rates ought to be. So you could think about the demand for savings, if you like, investment demand, that's driven by population growth and technological progress. It's driven by N plus G. And then there's a supply of savings. You know, and people will save more, let's say, if the interest rates are higher in real terms, and investment demand will fall off if real interest rates are lower. So it's just, there's just a demand and a curve and a supply curve. And the secular stagnation argument is that the demand curve is falling. The demand curve for loanable funds is falling because population growth is slowing, technological change is falling. Well, in that case, the, the interest rate will be negative. And in particular, the way that people conceptualize this nowadays is they say demand could fall so low that the, that the real interest rate that would maintain full employment effectively will become negative as well. And that might be a problem because negative interest rates are difficult to achieve. Now, they're easier to achieve than we thought five years ago because we have negative interest rates in a few Scandinavian countries. Uh, and yet, don't forget that there's a wedge between the interest rate that the central bank charges and the wedge that businesses have to pay. So it actually isn't, you know, isn't clear that actually the interest rate that we really care about uh, in terms of spurring investment demand will be negative uh, as well. Well, this is what's happened to interest rates. I just put in this one for fun because it's, you know, it's, uh, but no, so, so, so we, have, we, have, we have very low interest rates. And, and they're, they're, whoops, and they are historically low, yeah? And, and, and we know they're negative in many places. And there's no sign that they're going up anytime soon. And that is a symptom of secular stagnation. That's kind of what you would expect to see in a world where secular stagnation was an issue, where there just wasn't enough investment demand. And there are other symptoms of a world of secular stagnation that we can see around us. We've had a series of uh, bubbles, financial bubbles, as we all know, uh, and that's maybe what you would expect to see happen in this kind of environment. You have not enough real investment activity driving, driving uh, the economy forward, and so you know, what are you going to do with your money? Well, I, 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 there's not enough real investment opportunities, so I invest in you know, real estate or I invest in financial markets of various sorts, and you get a series of bubbles and busts, and as Larry Summers points out, the bubbles can sustain economic activity by sustaining consumption for a while, but it's not sustainable, and you end up in trouble down the line. So it's not mad to think that this might be an issue today, whatever your views about where we're heading in the future, and I honestly don't know. You know? Now, if this is a problem, then what should government do about it? The, ever since you know, about the 1980s, 1990s, Thinking about economic policy has sort of shifted. We used to think about fiscal policy and monetary policy being roughly equal, you know, having to do equal jobs. If there's unemployment, you'd lower interest rates, but you might also spend more money or lower taxes. Uh, I think it's fair to say that since the 80s or 90s, we tend to think that monetary policy is really what ought to take care of all of this stuff. And particularly, you ought to set interest rates sufficiently low that you can uh, have full employment. But as I showed you earlier, it may be a problem to do that because uh, the interest rate that you would need to get back to full employment might be negative. And that's, that's a difficult thing to uh, achieve. Uh, well, what are the options? One option would be to engineer a higher inflation rate. Because if you engineer a higher inflation rate, then you know a zero nominal interest rate can translate into a negative real interest rate. And there are lots of respectable people, actually, who think that we should, for example, be thinking about raising inflation targets from 2 to 4%, you know? And I think that, you know, economic historians of the 22nd century, if they were to look back at today and say, God, that was a terrible mess they got themselves into, and can you imagine they had to have, you know, 4% inflation for a couple of decades? Well, you might think we'd gotten away with it reasonably cheaply. But there are people who doubt whether it's as easy to engineer higher inflation as is sometimes claimed. And if you take that view, then you might actually need fiscal policy. And here's the problem, which is fiscal policy typically means running deficit. Uh, 
deficits. You know, it means you know spending more money or lowering taxes. You're adding to the deficit. You're adding to debt. There are issues of financial uh, sustainability that uh, come into to play there. Unless, of course, you choose to finance the uh, extra expenditure with helicopter drops of money, you know, by printing money. You know, give the European Investment Bank a banking license and allow them to, to create liquidity and spend it on things. You know, that some people argue, argue that's a good idea. But if you think of traditional fiscal policy being a, an appropriate response in this context, well, then there is this, this issue about financial sustainability, which is worrying, which is where another Dane uh, comes in, a guy called Jörn Gelting from Aarhus. Uh, he pointed out that if you not borrow and spend, but if you tax and spend, that can also help to maintain aggregate demand. Right? And even if you've never done any economics, it's easy enough to see how that works. If you tax and spend, you're taking money away from people. Some of that money that they would have had otherwise would have been saved. Right? And so that, that savings is no longer going to happen, and the government's going to spend it instead. And this is where you get the famous balanced budget multiplier. And there's a very nice uh, discussion by, by Paul Samuelson where he says, if you're the sort of person who really worries about uh, small government, you know, you're an old-fashioned classical liberal, you really want small government, and you find yourself in a world like this, you know, be aware that you may end up having to run big fiscal deficits, and that might have a financial stability consequence. And he says, if, if on the other hand, you're the sort of person who really worries about large-scale government borrowing, you really care about financial stability, well, then maybe the cost that you have to pay is to have a, a government that's gobbling up a larger share of GDP than you would otherwise want to be the case. In other words, just government on its own can be a stabilizing element in the economy. And you know, you could argue that if you think about the crisis in 2009-10, compare Dublin with some of the provincial cities, you know, there was money coming into civil servants' pockets and being spent in Dublin, and Dublin was never as as completely awful as, as some of the towns you know, down, down the country where, where there was no income left being generated. That's just a, a way of visualizing it. But, but you, can, you can make an argument more scientifically that government expenditure is itself a stabilizing element in the economy. Uh, and of course, one of the things that has changed since uh, the interwar period is that government has indeed become bigger, as we know. You know? And what's interesting about these, these, these interwar theorists is they were very clear about the ideological implications of their arguments. It wasn't, they were upfront about it in a way that I think economists today aren't. You know, we tend to say that's not anything to do with us, but, but we speak, I think, sometimes out of both sides of our mouths. So that was what Dan wanted me to talk about, but I also wanted to talk about a political economy uh, argument for why you might want a state. Um, and this has to do with maintaining the political support for free markets, okay? Uh, a lot of my work has looked at globalization and at anti-globalization backlashes, all right? There have been many points in history where globalization has gone into reverse. And this has often happened because globalization doesn't help everybody. It actually creates winners and losers. That's what standard trade theory says. And if the losers, you know, have a chance, they may vote in politicians who will put up tariff barriers or put on uh, restrictions on immigration or, or what have you. So this is looking at the ratio of builders' wages to basically the returns to holding land, you know, the price of an acre of land, that sort of thing, in America and in Australia. And over the late 19th century, it goes from 19, 1870 to 1913, and you can see that the, this ratio is falling everywhere. And it's falling because globalization, what's it doing? It's connecting the frontiers, which are empty, with crowded little Europe. And the frontiers are exporting food to Europe, and the Europeans are exporting manufactured goods to the frontiers. And so who are the big winners in America? It's going to be the, the people who own the land, because the demand for land increases. As, you know, it's bid, you know, the price of land is bid up as they, as they sell ever more food uh, to us. And who are the big losers in Europe? Well, it's the landowners, isn't it? Uh, because cheap food is going to drive down land rents. So this is a terrible time to be an aristocrat in Britain, for example. So in Britain, or Ireland, or Denmark, or Sweden, or you know, any other country in Europe that you can think of, you find that the workers, it's the opposite. Workers are increasing, seeing their incomes increase relative to the incomes of landowners. So it's good for workers, they get to eat cheap food, bad for farmers, or peasant farmers, Prussian yunkers, uh, British aristocrats, whoever. What happens uh, in France, in Germany, in Italy, in Sweden, all around the continent, with one or two exceptions only, 
they, they, they move from having gone in a free trade direction for about two decades to slamming on the brakes and they put on tariff barriers. And you can relate it very well to these income distribution effects of globalisation. So globalisation is undermining itself. Migration, same, same story. This is taken from a, a, one, of, one of my books. Um, but what, what do I want to show you? For example, Ireland here. So between 1870 and 1913 in Ireland, uh, what is this saying? The emigration lowered our labour force by 36%. Big reduction. If you lower the labour supply by 36%, what's that going to do to your wages? It's going to, it's going to increase them a lot, we think, by about, by about a third. You know, so we got a lot more prosperous uh, before World War I. It was largely because of emigration lowering... Uh, the ratio of workers to land and, and, and increasing real wages. The problem is, it's the opposite effect on the other side of the Atlantic. If you look at Argentina here, for example, uh, uh, emigration is increasing their labour force by 86%, you know, and that's going to lower their wages. Immigration lowered American wages and so on. So emigration, uh, emigration is, is, is helping workers in Europe during the late 19th century. It's hurting workers in the New World. It's making Europe more equal because workers are at the bottom of the scale. It's making America more unequal because workers are at the bottom of the scale. Um, this is what happens to immigration policy in a bunch of countries uh, in the New World during this period. Basically, this is an index of how open you are to immigration, so completely open, completely closed. And what you can see, there's differences in timing, but on average, uh, they're, they're becoming more restrictive. Right? So in America, a big change is 1917 when they imposed the Literacy Act, which is going to exclude a whole bunch of Europeans. You have to be able to read or write. And then they put on quotas in 1924, and that's the end of their open-door policy. Now, the point is that uh, if you plot those policy evolutions against measures of uh, income inequality, so the other graph there, it's the ratio of wages to average incomes, what you find is that there's a pretty clear correlation that emerges in the data. These countries, workers are seeing their relative position in the pecking order decline, and guess what happens? These countries start putting on barriers to immigration. There's another dimension of globalization that undermines itself because of its effect on income distribution. Now, are there analogies today? Well, let's leave migration aside for the moment. You can obviously, you know, that's an obvious one that comes to mind. In terms of trade, the big thing that's changed uh, since the 1970s, uh, but really only since 1980, is that the North is importing manufactured goods from the South rather than primary products. So we used to import primary products, uh, you know, food, raw materials of all sorts. They were essentially complementary to our, our own economic activities. But now they're competing with us head on in manufactured in manufacturing. Now head on, that's you know, so so what's happening is we're shifting out of various lines, that like televisions, which we no longer produce and so on, but but still there's more competition than there would have been back in the 1950s or the 1850s. So this is a major shift. So who are the equivalents? of today's, uh, today of the European landowners of the late 19th century, I guess unskilled workers is who most of us uh, would think of. And in fact, it's the case, as you know, that the unskilled in rich countries today are hostile to trade and they're hostile to immigration. Now, there's two ways to read this. The self-congratulatory view is to say, well, they are just less sophisticated than people like us. They haven't gone to college and they, they just don't understand, right? In that case, you'd expect, I think, to see that unskilled workers everywhere across the world are hostile to globalization. That's not, in fact, what you observe. What you observe, this is, this is the correlation between being high-skilled and being protectionist. So you know, this number here is saying that in, in the US, the correlation is negative. So in the US, the high-skilled are less protectionist. right? But you move to poorer countries, and the correlation becomes negative and then eventually reverses. You get to poorer countries, the high-skilled are more protectionist, and it's the low-skilled who are in favor of free trade. And if you were to widen the sample out further to sort of China and so on, you'd find that coming out even, even more clearly in a graph. You know? So this is suggesting that maybe these people do sort of intuit at some level what globalization has been doing to them. Now, what can governments do about this, if anything? Oh, yeah, by the way, I always show this because I was in France at the time. I was in, I was in uh, a little mountain village writing that book, as it happens, and all of the young people in the village in 2005, all the young people were voting no, of course. And then I go up to Paris 
in Sciences Po, and of course all the young people there were voting yes, you know, so it was very obvious to me what was going on, but the, the, the anecdote generalizes, you know, we know that there was a big class divide, and we know there was a big class divide in Lisbon, one in Ireland as well, you know, it was the working class areas that voted uh, no, and, uh, you know, Dunleary and places that voted yes. Now, and, and I think in both cases there was a globalization thing going on. I know that the constitutional treaty was actually about rules and so on, but it became a vote about the market, about delocalization, as they call it, about the Polish plumber, and so on. And polling suggested that in, 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 in you know, the west of Dublin and so on, during Lisbon 1, immigration was an issue at the door. And there's, we certainly found a big correlation between hostility towards immigration and voting no, uh, myself and Richard Sinnott, when we, when we looked at that. So it's beginning to influence politics now, and, and it clearly is influencing politics more generally now if we look at the National Front and various other similar uh, parties. So what can government do? I think the government can do something. It's not just a question of you stay open and you say to hell with the losers or you give in to the losers and you go closed. Governments can maybe do things to maintain enough political support for markets that markets stay generally open. So again, I'll take you back to, to my period, the late 19th century. Governments can do two things. There's a regulatory state and there's a fiscal state. What you find in the late 19th century is that they make all sorts of moves towards providing better worker protection. Uh, you know, so night children, night work for children prohibited, you know, factory inspection acts, all that kind of stuff. And they come in right across the board during this very globalized period. And even more sort of significantly for the future is they start bringing in uh, various sorts of social insurance protections. Uh, so not just uh, injury compensation, so on the unemployment insurance, uh, old age insurance, you know, so, so. Your homework for today is to go back to the censuses of 1901 and 1911 and see if uh, in your family also it is the case that your, your ancestors added more than 10 years to their age between 1901 and 1911, because, because that certainly was true in the O'Rourke's, I'm afraid. Uh, and it was true, I think, generally, and not just in Ireland either, by the way. You know, it's not just an Irish thing. So they brought, well, they brought in the pension, yeah, be aged by more than 10 years. But the point is, you know, this is the sort of thing that might possibly maintain support for open markets, right? Insurance, markets are risky, you know? Insurance reduces risk. That's, that's kind of the point. And, yeah, if you look at who the countries are that are going to the fore in this, uh, it's, it's the smaller, more open countries. It's the Belgians, it's the Denmarks, it's the, it's the Swedens, and so on. Those are the ones who are bringing in, 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 into, into being the, the, the really heavy social insurance programs. Uh, and so on. So there's no sign of a race to the bottom here, you know, because that's something that you often hear, you know, globalization, we'd like to do all these things, but globalization means we're so, it's, things are so tough and competitive that we just can't, you know, tax so as to provide these sorts of services. Well, that's not how it worked back then. Actually, it was the smallest and most open economies that did uh, the most in the way of taxation. And sometimes there was actually a race to the top. So there's a nice example of a treaty between France and Italy in 1904. The issue was that Italian workers were coming to France to get social welfare benefits. So what do you do? And, you know, because the French could have just kicked them all out. That would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, instead, what they did is they said, we will allow you to continue to migrate here, but you will put in place the same social welfare protections in Italy as we have in France, so there won't be welfare shopping. You know, so that, that's a nice example where actually competitive forces and globalization led to a sort of race to the top, if you I mean, it's a bit normative, the language bottom and top, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's not just a 19th century story, is the point. It's a late 20th century story as well. So this is a famous graph taken from Danny Roderick. It's a partial correlation, so he's co correcting for things like size of country and so on. So other things being equal, countries that are more open have bigger governments. So no, no sign of a race to the bottom there as well. So what's going on? You know, so he thinks that what's going on is that in more open countries, Workers and other people are exposed to more risks, you know, uh, and so the state steps in and provides various welfare nets and safety nets, and social insurance and so on, and that's what's going on. It's demand for insurance. So, you know, think about, you know, Denmark maybe being the prime case. They've been very, very globalised for, you know, 150 years, and they have this flex security that we all talk about and so, and so on, right? So, so markets and social insurance oftentimes go together. Um, because of the demand effect. Now, the, the people who are worried about or, or who look forward to a race to the bottom, I guess, emphasise the, the cost of providing 
social insurance, right? That you know, it may be more difficult to sustain high tax rates because you, you lose mobile capital or whatever. What, what that graph shows us is that at least through the 1990s, the demand side effect was, was outweighing this, 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 this cost of providing uh, insurance effect. But that's no reason to think that this will necessarily continue to be the case in the future. However, what I would just point out, okay, you can't see those numbers, I, I saw, I'm sorry, but has there ever been a group of countries more closely uh, integrated economically in world history than the member states of the European Union? Probably not, right? Completely single market, single capital market, common labour market in many ways. You know, there, there's never been more globalisation than the globalisation that unites these countries. And yet, there are countries like ourselves that you know, tax about 30%, a little bit more of our income. There are countries like the Danes that tax 50%, and we all seem to manage to cohabit. So I think that the, you know, the notion that states are... are uh, are, are, are handicapped, that they can no longer act in a globalised world because the globalisation is, is overdone, actually. You just look at the different choices European countries are making, and that proves the point, you know, or if you, if you, you, know, if you think about, say, Cyprus uh, putting on capital controls, if you want to do it, you can do it, you know, it's just a question of whether you want to do it or not, whether the costs or the benefits are greater. So it's time for me, I think, to sum up. Um, and I think, what, yeah, what I want to say is that there is a tendency on both the right and the left to view states and markets as, 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 as opposites. You know, you have more state, you have more market. And I think that's the wrong way to view it. Uh, if you think about Keynes himself, he was actually deeply conservative. We think of him as a lefty now, but he was actually deeply conservative. He was writing in a world where communism was a real alternative, politically, where the suppression of private property was a real alternative, where governments getting involved in the minutiae of running the economy was a real alternative. And his view was, no, you get one thing right, just maintain aggregate demand at a level consistent with full employment, and you can have private property and you can leave things to the market as best you can. It was an essentially conservative uh, project. And similarly, the people who set up the welfare states in Europe after World War II, I mean, they were, they were not revolutionaries. That's the whole point. They were not revolutionaries. They were essentially conservative. You know, the social democratic project uh, was all about maintaining support for markets, ultimately. And so... Uh, that's, the, that's the line I, I think I would like to push, that if we go too far in the direction of the market uh, and at the same time suppress all of the things that can help maintain political support for market, you risk having a backlash. Uh, and maybe a question is, uh, is Europe, what, is, what is Europe's role in, in all of this? Uh, is Europe uh, as keen on maintaining social protections as it is on extending the market? I guess that's, that's, that's the thing. The thought I'd like to leave you with.